M. Rossiano and Michael Lucas. It was like viewing another species on another planet. This is M. Salation. I don't blame them if they don't feel safe. We're crossing lines. We are not. It's all we've got in lockdown. I am becoming you. It's like you possessed me. <laughs> I want to implement a safe word for my family. And I'll just shout at them, banana, banana. You're in M. Salation. Tick, 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 tick. Tick my box. Hello, everyone. Welcome to M. Salation. This is my 11th attempt at this intro, not even joking, I've been sitting here for an hour. Normally, this podcast is lighthearted and we chat about frivolous things from Harry Styles to offspring to jizz, you know, and this intro is normally the easiest part. I just kind of talk a bit about the things that I've been thinking about and trying to process and oftentimes those things, you know, aren't heavy. But what's been weighing on my mind and what I have been trying to process is what's happening in America. America is in crisis. There are riots. There are police killing unarmed black people. And I have not been sure what I should say about that and if indeed I should say anything because I don't want to add to the chorus of white voices having an opinion on a subject they have no business having an opinion on. But I figured staying silent puts me on the same side of the perpetrators. And I also figured if it's something that I'm grappling with and it's something I want to be better at, a lot of you guys are like me and have the same beliefs as me. I figure a lot of you guys would like to be better allies as well because I realised I haven't been as good an ally as I thought I was being. I'm patting myself on the back because I'm not racist. But that isn't good enough anymore. Not being racist isn't good enough. You have to be better. You have to do more. You have to ask yourself, how am I educating myself? How am I lifting up the work and lives of people of, you know, of colour and Indigenous people in my community? And you also need to remember that it's not up to Indigenous people or people of colour to educate you as a white person, if you are a white person listening right now. If you're a person of colour listening right now, then you know it's not your job. It's white people's job to do the work and educate themselves. You can literally Google, how can I be a better ally? And you will get pages upon pages of works done by black authors and researchers and academics. If you want to, it's a choice you make to stay ignorant now. I want to be a better ally and I'm on a journey to do that. And yes, I know how gross it is to use the word journey, but that is exactly what it is. So on Wednesday, you're going to get another bonus edition of this podcast. I'm going to be speaking with one of the smartest people I know. I can't believe I tricked her into being my friend. Her name is Santilla Chingape and she's an award-winning journalist, documentary filmmaker. She explores migration, cultural identities and politics. Santi was born in Zambia and moved to Australia with her family when she was nine. And I felt strange about approaching her on this because again it's not her job or not her role to make me a better ally but I did know that she would be able to have a conversation that would help all of us understand why we need to be better allies. This episode is going to be a little bit different and it's going to challenge you and I ask that you listen to it with an open heart and an open mind and questioning yourself and how you can be better doesn't mean that you're a bad person now. Wanting to be better and grow is just such a great thing. So some of the things I've already learned on how you can be better, donate to Black Lives Matter, sign petitions, pull up friends and family if you hear or see them doing or saying racist things. You need to now be proactive, not passive or reactive. I hope you enjoy today. Michael and I are going to talk a bit about MasterChef, but we are also going to focus a lot on how we're feeling about what's happening in America and how we can be better. Scott also chimes in. He caught me having a slight meltdown over it and there's a surprise, surprise coaching session that happens, but I think it might help you too. And then he does help out one of you guys who um, is feeling like she gives all her best work and attention to the people that she works with and she gets home and her family get the kind of crappy end of the stick, which again was something everyone can relate to. So um, sit back, hopefully you learn something and um, yeah, enjoy what's to come. M. Rossiano and Michael Lucas. This is M. Salation. Joining me now is the person I normally turn to when I need a moral compass. 
I mean, it's no surprise he joins me every episode. I don't know why I introduce him like you don't know who it is. Michael Lucas. <laughs> when you need a moral compass or also seemingly a, a, a partner in jizz jokes seems to be my other it's role. Just, it's so true. But you are my go-to. You and Jamila Rizvi, in fact, and I did speak to you both late last night. And um, the situation in America and what's going on and it's just dominating all the news stories. It's even knocked coronavirus off of everything, which – you know, just when you thought there could be nothing possible to do that, America in crisis has done so. And I think I think the reaction of Australians has been quite interesting and that's what I wanted to talk to you about because there's been a lot of, you know, thank God we don't live there going on, right? Yeah, which is understandable in the context of the coronavirus. Well, it's un- I mean, it's mm. understandable on both fronts. I mean, thank God our cities, you know, haven't descended into violence, but I think behind that statement, even the Prime Minister was out this morning saying, how, how beautiful is it to live in Australia? What Because Australia is, we're a fair country and and uh, and it, it feels like there is buried in there some kind of willful blindness, which is what makes it so uncomfortable. Well, I kind of touched on that earlier before you got here in that over 400 Indigenous people have died in police custody since 1991 and not one police officer has been held responsible in a court of law. So I think, I don't think we get to kind of stand back and look on in judgment in America's history um, with their Indigenous population or with, you know, African-Americans or Native American Indians. I think I'm always astounded at how that's just kind of brushed under the rug and, you know, oh, aren't we a lucky country? Well, if you ask our Indigenous population, I don't think that they would feel that we are a lucky country. Exactly. And, you know, in America we've watched as, you know, for example, the, the, the black athletes that took a knee at the NRL games, how that, that was so outrageous. And now things keep progressing and progressing and progressing to the state that it's in. But we have so many of those traits too. We Like as a country, we lost our shit when Adam Goods did an Indigenous dance at, a, at an AFL game. And I think that there is this a bit more of a, it's a bit more out of sight, out of mind in Australia. And I don't think that's anything to be proud of. No, it isn't. And as, as someone who, and I realised, like, and I was really ashamed, you know, this was, I was up all night thinking and I just, I always consider myself an ally to um, LGBTQI community, to people of colour, to any marginalised group. I, 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 but then I realised I'm not a very good ally because I just thought it was enough to not be racist. I just thought it was enough to raise good people and participate in events that, you know, champion Indigenous people and, and people of colour, it's not enough. And I realised that last night. I'm part of the problem. I'm part of the comfortable, privileged white people who think that they're allies when, in fact, just not being racist isn't enough. Well, I think there was this this theory that if we could just raise a generation and, and behave ourselves as though we're, we're colourblind and, and treat everyone equally, then then surely the situation will rectify itself. But... I think we can see now that you just it, it needs to go further. You can't. You need to be proactive in 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 your attempts to to combat racism. It's not enough to just raise a child to say don't judge people based on the uh, colour of their skin. It, it, you need to go that step further to raise them to understand, frankly, the the privilege that they live in and and how oppression affects people. And it's, and it's so such complicated an uncomfortable and thing. difficult. Yes, I know. It is. <laughs> God, and, and and I am uncomfortable. I'm sweating right now, even though it is minus 10 degrees in my house, and, I, and I'm worried about this podcast going out, and it's hard to be talking about this stuff because, you know, any time I have an opinion on anything controversial, just even as a woman, people come for me. And But, but who cares? I mean, people have been coming for people of colour for centuries. Like, I need to stop being... Like, I'm, I'm just so scared to do the wrong thing. I don't do anything. I've got analysis paralysis. And I think a lot of people feel like that. I think a lot of white people who consider themselves allies, we're not as good as we should be because we have a fear of doing the wrong thing. But it's also very important to remember it is not a person of colour's responsibility to educate you as a white person. It is your job to educate yourself. And that's the other thing, people crying and turning to their black friends and saying, oh, I feel so bad, that's just adding to their trauma. 
you need to reverse out of that and educate yourself, which is another, you know, tough pill to swallow. And move away from, you know, there's just so much defensiveness around, yes. you know, I mean, every year Australia Day rolls around and every year we have a mirror image debate that we've had, you know, every year on the breakfast radio shows and on morning TV and everything like that, there'll be just these pitted arguments about, well, why should we have to change the date? And just so much defensiveness, just about hearing someone else's perspective and maybe accepting that you've been the beneficiary of privilege and that you haven't had to consider all of these sort of things seems to kind of paralyze us. And I, I, the only way that we can move past it is if we do start to talk about it as as uncomfortable as it is, and it is uncomfortable. Yeah. But it should be uncomfortable. So I mean, that's the only way things are going to change. It should be. Has there been uh, particular articles and speeches given that, have, that you've latched onto this weekend? Trevor Noah's one was a big one for me. I don't know if you've seen that yet. He did this yeah. amazing 18-minute mm. long dissection. And it's basically sort of saying what would bring someone to turn to violence and, and looting. And he just very, very calmly out, outlines, as he sees it, the, the domino effect. And that's really worth watching if you can. Yeah, I, I have watched it. And for me, I watched a woman, her name's Joma Olo, and she is an activist and an academic um, African-American and she did a, a video on her Instagram account, it was 20 minutes long, talking about what violence truly is. And it's about, um, people are talking about the looting as violence, but she talks about the violence against her people and the deep well of trauma and the, the genocide and the mass incarceration and the mass unemployment and the, and the forced labour and, and the rape of black women. And she, she talks about that's violence. So don't talk to us about target being smashed up the only time white people have paid attention to us is when their material possessions are threatened and she she talks you know to white people and says what are you doing you've got to be like it's it's, for me as someone who's an ally and open-minded I found it really uncomfortable to watch and if I'm finding it uncomfortable to watch I can imagine the average Joe who needs to be part of this conversation would want nothing to do with it but we have to be prepared to be uncomfortable to make things better and you know People like to be comfortable. I know. And I, there is this thing at the moment when people, like including our own Prime Minister today, you know, they're just focusing on um, any violence or any destruction that happens with the protesters. And, you know, I understand why as a, as a leader and everything they need to sort of speak against violence. But we also, have to, like all of the movements, the, the gay rights movement, for example, you know, Stonewall was a violent riot. I mean, now, you know, Absolute Vodka sponsors Pride Week and things like that. And even mm. women getting the votes, the suffragettes, were, they mm. were bombing. <laughs> they, were, they were making bombs and detonating them in, in mm. this time last century. And unfortunately, when there is that much kind of oppression, often it manifests itself in, in this way and, 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 and you know, just purely focusing on that and not taking a step back or, or, or using that as sort of a shield for say, well, I'll talk about the violence that's happening to Target, but I won't, you know, take a step back to look at the context of it is in its own way, you know, unhelpful. Well, I'm going to vow to be better. I'm going to read more. I'm going to educate myself more. And I'm hyper aware that I have this platform and, you know, I know we, we had 200,000 downloads last month. I know how many people listen to us and I know the change that we can help affect. And even though we're a comedy podcast and I'm just a comedian and you're a writer of, you know, strong female leads, I think <laughs> it's our responsibility to have conversations about it in a way that, you know, we're not attacking anyone, but we're just trying to educate ourselves and a lot of other people in the hope to make things better. And I don't think that we should, anyone should be attacked for that. I don't think anyone should feel threatened by it either. No, exactly. <sighs> okay, let's have a little break. Let's reset and come back and talk about something a bit lighter. Master Chef. you're hot and you're cold, you're yes then you're no, you're in then you're out, you're up then you're down. Master Chef is getting to the pointy end of the competition, to borrow a phrase from Osha Gunsberg, knee Andrew G., and we lost, look, we lost a favourite last night. She exited the competition, well, on Sunday night, I should say. She exited the competition with a dodgy dessert. There's no kind way to put it. That's exactly right. She, she mixed mm. carrot and raspberry, which was the challenge. But unfortunately, the mm. mix did not come together. 
And she was a shocking, they <laughs> promised a shocking departure and she genuinely was. She she was, I predicted she would be at least top two, if not the winner. Top two? I reckon, didn't she think? Really? I thought it was maybe going to yeah. come down to her and Poe or her and Reynold. Mm, I suppose. I think it's going to be Reynold and Poe though. Oh, what a showdown. But, what an absolute showdown. I wouldn't be sad if they, maybe they could send Andy home. <laughs> I'm finding it increasingly hard to hide my feelings about Andy's judging style. My family now refuse to watch MasterChef with me because I abuse the telly so much. He doesn't ever actually speak about the food. He just speaks in these round terms or he could be talking about footy or he could be talking about the parfait in front of him and I can't tell the difference. (laughs) I mean, this always does feel like... Melissa, simultaneously, she delicately describes a cultural and emotional context, beautifully describes the taste with incredible adjectives. I mean, gossamer, where did that come from? And then you do cut to Annie, it's like, oh, that's bloody delicious, eh? But (laughs) maybe they feel like, do you think there is any value in the contrast? (laughs) Or am I just sitting here basically? No! (laughs) No, there's no value. And and, And on Sunday night, he just walked around saying, oh, you're playing it a bit safe, mate. You're playing it a bit safe, mate. I'm like, mate, you're in head-to-toe beige. You are the human embodiment of playing it safe. Shut up. I don't (laughs) want to hear it. Unless Andy's going to give me a great critique of the – he's superfluous and he just mansplains everything Melissa says and I know he's a nice guy and I'm playing the ball, not the man. I'm not attacking him personally. I'm attacking the way he judges and I have a real problem with it and I want him to stop repeating what Melissa says but in bloke terms – it's offensive. There I said it. <laughs> Do you think that in some ways he, he – but he makes Melissa look more lustrous? No, I look, I'm just really nope. hunting for nah. a silver lining here. I really, <laughs> really am. I know. I see what I'm doing. Oh, good. I'm glad you said. But uh, all right, so who are, you top, who are you picking top two, MasterChef? Who are you, who are you going to say? <sighs> well, now I'm going to say – I'm going to say Poe and Reynolds. Yeah, same, same, same. Okay, good. Oh, what a right. showdown it would be as well. Also because – and they're perfect adversaries because he is so sort of structured and deliberate and, and sticks to the plan, whereas she yeah. is chaos. She's chaos yeah. and art, and he's, yeah. mind you, he's pretty artistic too. I mean, I just think that'd be a fascinating – they'd be a fascinating show. Yeah, but he's more, he's more precision – and she's more wandering around in the garden looking for flowers with 30 seconds to go. Do you know what I mean? I so, love it so much. Yeah. I stand by her <laughs> to the end. I actually see elements of, I mean, they're incredibly talented, but I recognise little bits of myself in both of them. I can be very sort of one-eyed like he is and stick to the plan, but I can also get lost in a garden. I would also love it if Bruce and Brendan were the final two. The two gay best friends. Oh, that would be amazing too. The GBFFs are so cute. I do live for them. I love them. I live for them. That would be a wonderful. I, I just see them both falling on their mixes and saying, you take it. No, you take it. It would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I know you've got a busy day. Thank you for having a tough conversation and um, we'll chat again in a couple of days. We will. This is Emsolation. Okay, well, it's Tuesday, which means my husband's allowed in on the podcast. <laughs> He's sitting next to me. He's looking at his wife, who's a nervous wreck. Hello. G'day. You want me to explain why I'm a nervous wreck? No, no, I just thought, um, you know, you were very concerned about representing that issue and what you wanted to contribute to it and all that. Very concerned about doing that well yeah. without, become, uh, without adding to the problem. Yes, and the issue he's talking about is racism and obviously, you know, this whole episode has been me talking about the top, then Michael Lucas and I and with a brief interlude on MasterChef. But, um, yeah, I do feel – I've just recorded – at the start of every podcast you guys hear it, I do this little bit, my monologue we call it, like I'm a Tonight Show host. And today's – I kind of stayed up late writing and second-guessing whether I do it because – I don't want to make things worse, but I also feel a modicum of self-preservation because often these things come back at me in the form of angry white men. Yeah, I mean, these types of subjects are really triggering for in lots of different ways. Mm. So what was your intention by talking about this? What were you hoping to do by bringing this onto the podcast today? Am I getting surprise, surprise coached right now? No, no I've got two questions and oh, that's okay. one of them. That's all. Um, my intention was to use my platform to hopefully take a step to making things better and kinder and more understanding and I feel like it's my responsibility as someone who has the year of many hundreds of thousands of people and I assume that 
the people who follow me are pretty open-minded because I think you have to be to follow someone like me. I think maybe that I have a chance to make a difference with my audience because I feel like a lot of them are open-minded and perhaps just haven't been in the, and I'm sure a lot of them are already educated on this. And I've made an assumption that not everyone knows exactly how to be a great ally, but I just thought, cause I didn't know how to be a good ally. Perhaps other people wanted to be, but didn't know how to be. So that's why I did it. And uh, last question. So what's your biggest concern in all this? That I've somehow said the wrong thing, that I've made it worse, that I've done something inadvertently politically incorrect, that I'm just adding more shit to the steaming trash pile that that this whole thing has become in America and I don't want to do that. I want to be helping to make it better, not worse. Well, this is just between me and you, two husband and wife and friends. Uh, two husbands and wives? <laughs> <laughs> Have you done your best? Yes, I've done my best. I'm about to talk to my friend Centilla and that's going to be another episode that will come out this week. She's an incredible African-Australian who does – all her work is in this area. She's an award-winning journalist and I always try to default to people who are smarter and better than me to educate myself um, because sometimes I think the internet can be a huge void and, and I think it's also tailored to you. Like, you know, you don't necessarily go outside of your normal circles. Mm. So I'm doing that. So, yes, I am and I have. So it's this is like um, – there's a bit of a pattern here in terms of uh, – I reckon there's transferable learnings here. So – this is really important to you, right? And and it's important to a lot of people and really is important to all of us, of course. You really, really – it's really important and you really want to do a jo- good job and you've done the best you can so there has to be almost like an acceptance, okay, what else can I do? And then all you can do is stay open to learning and improving. So can you see that's such a common life cycle, like something really important to me I want to have a good result. I can't really control the result. i just got to do my best, accept that, and then, okay, what else can I be stay open to to learn? I think that's the key. When discussing topics such as change the date, Australia Day, race riots, anything that kind of highlights white privilege, if you feel yourself getting uncomfortable, try and stay open because – Uncomfortable doesn't mean you're a bad person. Uncomfortable doesn't mean that you're in the wrong. It's unfamiliar. The whole thing about it is unfamiliar. And that literally you feel that in your body as foreign. And this isn't an easy solve. This is centuries and centuries of systemic disempowerment of a people. And it's not something that me, a white woman from the suburbs, can solve or you, whoever you are, but it's something that we can all incrementally contribute to making better. And if you don't try and if you stay silent, then you're just contributing to the problem. So I think reminding yourself to stay open when you feel like you're losing your breath and you feel a bit threatened and you're like, oh, am I don't agree with you. And that's okay if we don't agree, totally fine. Or um, I'm not a bad person. So why is being level to me just don't even worry about that. You don't need to protect yourself in that way, I would suggest. Even that's provocative, what I've just said there. But And I appreciate that it's all a bit Pollyanna of me as well because, again, white person, privileged, you know, coming at this in 2020 and deciding I'm going to use my platform now instead of just telling jokes, you know, about TV shows. And I understand that and I, and I regret that it's taken me this long to be more vocal. I'm aware of, of how far-reaching this is and how – entrenched it is and I don't think that I'm going to solve it but I do think it's my responsibility my duty now as it is yours to start asking questions and being better educated and that's something we can control you can control reading more books by black women and men you can control doing the research that's something you can do to show that you're interested about you know putting black stories in the center rather than having white people put themselves in the center which is as I've been saying Scott you bet every breakfast show this morning had an opinion on these riots when I don't think they probably should have. And uh, lastly, I think for you, you it's important to do, yes, get educated and then looking for opportunities where you can act and actually do real behaviours, whatever they are. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, you know, maybe we don't get to the other problem today. <laughs> well, now people are really tempted, aren't they? Like, no, what are you doing? You know? No, I mean, I mean, we can. We can talk about – so a woman, she came to you, she came to us and uh, – I thought it was really interesting because I think we're all guilty of what she's having a problem with. Let's have a listen. Hi, Em and Scotty. I'm Jessie. I'm 25 from Queensland and I am usually considered a really positive person. I think everyone would say that I'm happy and I'm joyful all the time. 
But I feel like when I get home to my partner, I'm very negative and I I don't really know why. I feel like maybe I've used all my energy being positive all day, but I need some help, some strategies to help me, you know, really not take it out on him if I'm exhausted. So there's a few things I know you found interesting, the way that she described herself. Yeah, so, you know, um, I try to be a really positive person. I'm known as being a positive person, da-da-da-da. So that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Why was that interesting? Well, it's it's a choice of words. It's a it's a label. It's it's a reference point that she's sort of um, yeah she's relating to. But it also means perhaps she feels pressure to only ever be that. Well, that was I got to be honest. There's other things here. There's other elements that could be. It could be logistical, the whole thing. Um, but yeah, that was the first thing that jumped into my mind. Are you being authentic? Are you being yourself or are you being positive? And I wonder if the reason why I mean I'm get cutting to the chase here. Hang on, let me just jump back because I want to be fair here. If we're looking at solving this, here's just a few different ways you can look at it and I'm sure you might have covered some of these ways. So first of all, how do you want things to be? So you're not happy with the current situation. How do you want things to be? You know, like in your mind, play it a little picture about how it would be when you get home or the whole day. So what, what, what does it want to look like between you two? Next thing is, you know, what do you notice about your energy levels across the day? I reckon being tuned into your energy levels right across the phases of the day. And is there a prioritising there? I'm also interested in when you're walking back into your home uh, through the door or you're pulling up in the driveway or however you, you know, enter your home, what's, what's going on at that point there? You know, is there something about your way of being that it was one way and then it's shifting into another way? And then also, I mean, how is the relationship with the partner? Is there things that want to be resolved there? And that might be bringing down the energy and all that sort of stuff. Can I ask you, though, why is it a kind of a human trait to save your worst for the people that you love the most? Well, now we're in the one that we started with, which is the one that we're probably most interested in finding out if it could be that. I don't know the answer to that. There could be a billion different reasons for that. But, yeah, the question I have is, yeah, are you being yourself or are you being positive? And if you're being positive because you feel like you need to live into that, then that is going to be tiring and you get exhausted. And then I was wondering, well, are these people at work essentially more important to you than your your closer relationship with your partner? Well, obviously not, but I think – maybe sometimes you feel like you've got less to prove with someone who already loves you so you don't try as hard. Yeah, which to me, if you you distill that down, that to me would say that you are behaving in a way that it is less important to you. In your mind, you go, no, no, but in reality, so that it's almost like are the opinions of others about you, you know, strangers, more important than the opinion of your partner? And I think... In most cases, that could be yes, not because because you almost feel like you've already got that one put away. Do you know what I mean? Like, I already know that they think I'm amazing, it's fine, but I haven't won these. And it's just human nature to win people over and want to do your best and be seen in the best light. Where if you already know your partner feels that way, I think you're less inclined to put in that effort. Yeah, and, and there could be lots of reasons why you decide to sort of think that way as well. How can we help Jess shift this? Well, those questions... Those questions, answering some questions about the whole situation. Like I said, you know, uh, being uh, aware of your energy levels across the day. So make sure that you're not physically tired when you do walk in the door. Ask yourself really what's important and how would that look? So if someone was observing you across the day and you wanted to prioritise your relationship when you get home or that whole situation, how does that look? As in how do I need to use my energy accordingly? If there are some things that are draining the energy, enthusiasm and positivity towards your partner because there's some unresolved issues, obviously get them out of the way, sort them out, deal with them. Mm. So I guess it's, it's sort of like it's very holistic here rather than sort of just, you know, tips to click your fingers to. But I think what's great is that she's aware of it. She's labelled it and named it, which hopefully means she's talked about it with her partner. Yeah, aware of it, label it, named it and now create it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, put that on a t shirt, Tal. Say that again. Well, you said she's being aware of it. Yeah, but make it snappy, make it snappy, go. Aware of it, label it, named it. Yeah. But now create it. Create it. Love that. It's a t shirt that says create it. I'm all about merch at the moment. We're making insulation merch too. That's good, isn't it? 
All right. Do you feel you've said all that you need to say? I don't know. You've got your notes. I don't want to cut you off. Uh, Is there any closing statement you wish to, wish to make to anyone listening who has been feeling like perhaps – you know, they're up and about at work oh, and then yeah. they... The other one is, and you know, you were talking about why might you treat your most intimate relationships a li- sometimes a little bit taken for granted, essentially? Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes we can get in, you know, this is just one idea. Sometimes we sort of feel like the feelings we get about that relationship aren't that great because there's nothing coming back to us. We're not getting it. But as we know, all great relationships the more you give with a full heart, the more you give, the more satisfying it is, the more you get. So you can really actually take responsibility and control what you get back from the relationship. And it's all about the giving part. So that essentially, the more you invest, the more you tend to re- receive, as long as the relationships are sound. Yeah. The exhausted mother and me would say, I'm giving enough. But that's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing a sneaky session with me at the top. It was so sneaky. It was a surprise attack. Surprise, surprise coaching. But it was worth it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good. It was good. People got a little dynamic into, a little look into when Em's panicking and how Scott unravels it. It's wonderful. All right, we'll chat to you next Tuesday. If you have something you'd like Scott to help you out with, the email is hello at com. Just record yourself like Jess did there. And um, Scotty B will tackle it for you, possibly come up with a line of merch. You never know. Well, that's it. Um, That was big and raw and hard and challenging as it should have been. I hope you took something out of it. It's my greatest wish. (laughs) I'm going to be stress eating until this episode comes out because I'm so nervous about it because I want it to be okay. But I am well-intentioned and I guess that's all anyone can be. I want you to remember to listen on Wednesday to the bonus ep with Santilla. I've just finished recording that chat and it is amazing. She's incredible. She's enlightening, she's generous, and um, I'm just grateful that she agreed to do it. I will catch you guys then. Can you tell how stressed I am about this? I just want to thank you for allowing me a space, and it means a lot where I can swing between Disney and the royal family and systematic racism and wanting to be a better ally and allowing me to be the complex, strange, weird highly emotional person that I am and still turning up each time I put one of these things out. It means a great deal to be seen by you guys for exactly who I am and be accepted. I don't know that I could have made something like this if I was still on Breakfast Radio and this is why this space is so important to me and you guys are so important to me. Thank you and uh, good luck on your journey to becoming better allies if you're choosing to come on it with me. Don't forget to listen Wednesday and we'll be back Thursday as usual also. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye.